Lego has been around for a long time. So long, in fact, that multiple generations now have grown up with plastic bricks to build with to pass those rainy Saturdays by. Something they've started to do comparatively recently, considering their history, is that they've started to tell stories alongside their themes. Lots of their original themes have had vague premises in the past, be that city or space police or pirates, but beyond that, they've never gone out of their way to tell actual stories. This all changed in 2001 when Bionicle launched, being LEGO's first story-driven theme. The original run lasted nearly 10 years, with multiple books, comics, and four direct-to-DVD films being released to help advertise the theme. In 2011, LEGO tried something new once more, deciding to give their new theme Ninjago a TV show to help promote the theme. This wasn't the first time LEGO had found themselves on TV, however. Hero Factory had a series of specials masquerading as a TV show on Nicktoons that ran for several years. There was also a half-hour LEGO Atlantis special that aired on Cartoon Network in 2010. Ninjago is the first fully-fledged TV show from LEGO to get a series order, however. And I'm sure most of you know the story. It ran for two seasons plus two pilot episodes before ending with the theme, only to swiftly get revived and renewed for more seasons once the toy line proved to be more popular than LEGO had anticipated. Now we're awaiting the release of the 12th season of the show, not only making Ninjago LEGO's first TV show, but also its longest running. And with nearly 10 years now of Ninjago TV content, the question can be asked, is it LEGO's best TV show? I think an easy answer would be to say yes, but then that wouldn't make much of a video. So let's take a look through each of LEGO's television series they've released over the years and compare. The first show I want to look at is what was planned to be Ninjago's successor, Legends of Chima. I watched the pilot episodes back when they first aired and quickly decided it was not a show I was going to enjoy, so I tuned out after that. For research purposes for this video, I went back and watched a few episodes that LEGO had available online, and it was pretty much what I remembered, that being, it's not that great. Visually speaking, I think it looks better than early Ninjago episodes and even some of the stuff that came before Sons of Garmadon. It might be due to the characters and who they are, but the models seem to have more texture to them and seem a little more lively, even when you compare it to Ninjago episodes that were produced at the same time. It's a nice change of pace and is certainly an improvement. However, the story just really isn't all there, and I couldn't connect to the characters in the couple episodes I watched. In the pilots and the first few episodes of Ninjago proper, you're able to form a connection to the characters quickly and easily, where of Chima, I just didn't get that for whatever reason. Vol just doesn't seem to take things seriously, which can make him annoying at times, and the voice acting doesn't help. Cragger seems to be a weak villain, but I didn't watch the whole show, so he might have improved over time, but none of the other characters really stuck out to me. The writing also seems like a punch down compared to Ninjago, making an effort to appeal to kids more and hurting his chances to finding an older audience. In one episode, Laval states that the Gorilla Tribe has multiple uses for the word dude in their vernacular. A seven-year-old might find this funny, but I stopped watching immediately after that. The editing also seems weird, with quick cuts over landscapes and just odd camera choices that made me think they are trying to keep up with kids' short attention spans. While the idea behind the show didn't seem like a terrible idea, being some sort of LEGO's answer to Legend of Korra, which was on around the same time, it just wasn't executed very well. Ironically, Chima seemed to be Ninjago's hero factory of how it was received by fans. Next, drawing more direct comparisons to Ninjago, we have Nexo Knights. This is a show I did watch the first season of, and oh boy was it a struggle. If I thought that Chima was dumbed down for kids, then Nexo Knights really was. It suffers from a similar problem that Transformers Robots of Disguise 2015 suffered from, in that the characters learn the same lessons over and over and over and never really change. Each problem of the episode is easily solved without much effort, and whatever lesson of the episode that's learned is easily forgotten by the next. Lance is the biggest offender when it comes to this, as he remains the same conceited jerk throughout the show without any change. Macy is probably the closest thing to an interesting character the show has, but she just ends up feeling like a watered-down version of Nia at that character's worst moments. I actually liked the kids that helped the knights out more than anyone else. The girl had some good sarcastic moments that helped bring some much-needed humor to the show. Visually, the show doesn't look that great either. They were certainly going for a unique art style compared to other LEGO shows, but I don't think it worked. It made the show look incredibly cheap, and the writing doesn't really help the overall feel of the show in that regard either. I will say that I enjoy the two villains, as having a book be your show's main villain is an interesting and at times hilarious choice. However, with the exception of the zany villains and at time creative set pieces that the show can't take credit for because they were based on the Lego sets on store shelves, Nexo Knights was just was never able to take off, and I think the fact that the final wave of toys never got a season to go with it is evidence of this. Another show currently running is Lego City Adventures. I'm not too familiar with it, considering it's new and it's airing on a TV channel I don't have access to, so I'm going to ignore it for now, but I do appreciate that they're actually trying to give Lego City some characters and not just recycle police and fire stations every few years. With all the traditional minifig-based shows out of the way, it's time to look at the other types of Lego shows. First up, we have Lego Elves, which ran for eight episodes on Netflix. 
I watched the first episode and lost interest halfway through, decided not to watch the entire thing. Its writing is aimed at an audience that is a lot younger than I am, not to mention a completely different gender. It's also very anime-inspired, which is something I don't particularly care for. However, I don't hold these things against the show like I do with Chima or Nexo Knights. The reason for this is the demographic that it's aimed toward, which is girls that are probably 7 to 10 years old. It's written for that audience, it probably works well for that audience, and I guess it did, but it looks like the theme ran its 3 year course and it's over, so I guess it wasn't overly successful. The reason that Shima and Nexo Knights gets points taken off for dumbing down their writing towards kids is because both shows are trying to reach the exact same demographic that Ninjago was, and except in cases where an odd season here or there didn't, Ninjago doesn't talk down to its audience. It's consistently aged with the audience it started with, becoming more mature as it goes along, but the show started out with a sense of maturity to begin with. While the adventures were fun and there were jokes to be had, the early seasons of Ninjago still made sure to take its core story of the Green Ninja seriously, which is something I think really resonated with kids when the show began. It's something that certainly resonated with me, and I was a teenager when the show started. So, while Elves seems to be closer in quality to Chimun than Ninjago, I don't necessarily think that makes it a bad show, since it's trying to reach a different audience. It's possible the idea at LEGO was to get girls into LEGO via friends, have them get introduced to story-based themes with Elves, and then hopefully branch into Ninjago or another story theme. Because Elves launched around the same time Bionicle G2 did, so it seems like it was trying to be a Bionicle-esque theme for girls. And I'm not going to say Ninjago-esque theme for girls, because Ninjago has a fair amount of girls in the fanbase already. It's a theme that appeals to both boys and girls very well. And speaking of Bionicle G2, it's time to talk about the journey to one. Oh no! God! No, God, please, no! 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 It's been talked about to death by YouTubers in the Bionicle community, so I won't touch on it long. The story is bad, the voice acting direction slash casting isn't great, and it left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. I hate to consistently plug myself like this, but if you like Bionicle, watch Bionicle Reiterated, in which I retell the G2 story and fix all the things it did wrong. The finale is coming soon. As bad as the show is though, I think it is the best LEGO TV show in one area, and that's the animation. There isn't another LEGO show that looks remotely like it, with the exception of Elves, but it's still different enough since it uses 2D characters. And when the animation works well, it works wonders. A great example is when Lee and Uxar are fighting Umarak the Shadowhunter in Episode 1. The animation is fluid and clean, and the art style really works well for the world of Bionicle. It's a nice in-between of creative liberties taken with the Miramax art style of the first three Bionicle films and the strictly toy-based designs of The Legend Reborn. I don't think there's really anyone in the Bionicle community that dislikes the Journey to One for the art style. The only failing it has is the storytelling and budget behind it. Because the story isn't the greatest, the show never gets to utilize the art style in full effect, and because of what are perceived to be budget constraints, there are moments where characters don't match their voice performances. A prime example of this is when the Toa are entering the vault inside the Maze of Control, and Galia sounds out of breath and worried about something, yet the animation is the group calmly walking into the room. It's weird. In some areas, I feel like the new production team behind Season 11 of Ninjago took a few animation cues from the Journey to One, as lots of the way the elemental powers work in the latest season remind me of how they worked in Journey to One. So, while the art style is fantastic, that unfortunately can't save the show from being bad. If memory serves, I think LEGO Friends has had a limited run TV series a time or two, but I really doubt it reaches the emotional highs and dramatic story beats that Ninjago does, so I won't bother mentioning it more. LEGO Unikitty was also a thing for a season, trying to cash in on the Cartoon Network randomness Teen Titans Go type humor, and considering it got cancelled after one season, I'm not sure it was really that successful. Which is too bad. If any character could tap into that type of comedy, it's Unikitty, but I think the fact that they had to get Tara Strong to replace Allison Brie for the show because budget hurt it. And that's not to diss Tara Strong, she's a great actress, but Unikitty's voice is so unique to that character that it sounds off whenever someone tries to do an imitation of it. So, unless I'm mistaken, I think we've pretty much covered everything when it comes to LEGO original IP. Of course, LEGO doesn't just have their own stuff, they also do licensed stuff, so we need to take a look at that. When it comes to the different licenses that LEGO has a hold of, it's surprising how many of them don't end up with LEGO specials or TV shows. A full LEGO Avengers series would be pretty cool, but instead we have one-off specials that don't really tie into each other and so can't be considered here. Most of the Disney-based stuff, such as Pirates of the Caribbean or Princess-related stuff, doesn't have anything except for the movie attached to the wave of sets to advertise it. Which, I suppose, makes sense, but occasionally we do get the odd series here or there that exists outside of the realm of just advertising a movie. LEGO Harry Potter's never had a TV special, let alone a series. One-off idea sets like Doctor Who or Back to the Future don't have specials or series, which to some degree is unfortunate. How awesome would a one-season, 13-episode LEGO Doctor Who series be? LEGO DC has tons of straight-to-DVD movies, but those are movies and not TV, which limits the pool of series to look at. 
One of those in the pool is a recent Jurassic World series called Legends of Isla Nublar. It's only aired about half its episodes so far as of this writing, and from what I've seen, it's okay. Just okay. Nothing spectacular, but not really anything bad, either. The animation seems to be done by the team that works on the LEGO DC movies, which I can only describe as... cheap. Maybe it's because I'm so used to Ninjago, but Will Film does the best job animating LEGO minifigures when you don't have the budget to make them look photorealistic like the theatrical LEGO movies. Working our way through different third-party IP LEGO has, we eventually land on arguably their biggest one, LEGO Star Wars. Star Wars has always been a behemoth of a franchise, and certainly doesn't need too much help selling more toys outside of new movie releases, but that hasn't stopped LEGO from trying. In 2013, we got our first LEGO Star Wars TV series with The Yoda Chronicles. It had a short two-season run of seven episodes total, and it's just really mediocre. Besides Tom Kane providing the voice of Yoda, Anthony Daniels as C-3PO, and Billy D. Williams as Lando Calrissian, there were not any returning actors from previous projects to voice the iconic characters, and that really hurts the show in a lot of ways since the replacements aren't good sound-alikes. There's even lots of Ninjago talent on the show, but it's pretty distracting when Anakin Skywalker opens his mouth and Cole's voice from Ninjago comes out. Now, a reason we probably got this show at all is to help advertise the sets for 2013 and 2014, which were Attack of the Clones or Revenge of the Sith related. These two years were themed like this because the original plan was to release 3D versions of those films after The Phantom Menace got the same treatment in 2012. However, George Lucas infamously sold his company to Disney later that year, and those plans were scrapped. Because of the advanced production cycle LEGO designs their toys in, though, they had those waves of sets ready to go, and without any sort of tie-in whatsoever, it seems like that helped lead to the creation of the Yoda Chronicles. I don't think it's a good show, but considering why it exists in the first place, I'm not sure it really had any chance of being good. In 2015, we got a new show titled Droid Tales. This is a vast improvement over Yoda Chronicles, but it still falls short in some areas. 2015 was the year that Episode 7, The Force Awakens, was released in theaters, so to catch kids up on the saga since the original six films weren't available to stream at the time, Droid Tales has C-3PO on a search for R2-D2 across the galaxy while telling the tale of Episodes 1 through 6. Some plot points are made easier for kids to follow, and jokes are had giving kids an entertaining catch-up on the story of Skywalker. However, it's not a standout series because of what it is, a long recap video. Dramatic moments in Star Wars are talked about and then gloss over quickly to get to the next plot point as a, at a breakneck pace, which means it's hard to connect with the story being told, but considering it's a recap, that's kind of the point. By this time, I'd given up on LEGO Star Wars having standout content on TV. While Star Wars has found great success on TV in the past with Clone Wars and Rebels, and the LEGO Star Wars toys are always great, it just didn't seem like it was possible to mix the two and make a good story-driven show for television. In 2016, though, I was happily proven wrong. LEGO Star Wars The Freemaker Adventures, and to a lesser extent its quasi-sequel All Stars, is what I had been wanting from LEGO Star Wars TV content for years by the time it aired. Set in between The Empire Strikes Back on Return of the Jedi, Freemaker Adventures doesn't focus on the main cast of the films, instead starring a family of three kids known as the Freemakers. In the absence of their parents, they run the family salvage shop on The Wheel, a location pulled from the old Star Wars expanded universe and are just trying to survive. They also have an old reprogrammed B1 battle droid from the Clone Wars named Roger, and unknown to all three, the youngest of their trio is a special force sensitive. While famous characters from Star Wars feature in the show, them not being the stars of it was a risky but ultimately wise move. If the show had not been written well, these new characters would be derided and ignored by the community at large, but as it turns out, the show is written really well. Xander, Cordy, and Rowan are a great group of protagonists, each member of the family bouncing off each other well and providing a believable family bond between the three. Roger serves as great comedic relief, being a murder bot turned nanny, often regaling guests about his service during the Clone Wars to a hilarious effect. The villains of the show are great as well. Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader serve as hilarious parodies of themselves while also remaining true to their characters. The new superior Death Star. Soon it will be complete. With its destructive power at our command, we shall crush the rebels once and for all. Meh. Meh? Meh! And while they serve as overarching villains, they're not the main villains. The primary Season 1 antagonist is Nare, some sort of dark side agent working for the Empire, and MOC is a droid built in Season 2 to hunt down our leads. His name is even a fun meta thing, as it stands for My Own Creation, which is what people use LEGO for, to build mocks, or their own creations. Grabal the Hutt also serves as a hilarious mid-tier villain who just wants to get enough cash to retire from the Hutt cartel and open a beachside resort. Being a B-list villain himself, he employs B-list bounty hunters such as Dengar and 4LOM. Not only are the characters charming, the story good, but it's also really funny. 
There shouldn't be too much surprise, as it's helmed by Bill Motts and Bob Roth, two writers that wrote many episodes of The Penguins of Madagascar, which excelled at character comedy. These characters have become so well-liked that, to some degree, they're official Star Wars canon now. Now, the show itself isn't, and we'll get into that in a moment, but the characters themselves exist in Star Wars canon, which is really cool. The reason the show itself isn't canon, however, is because of one of the really awesome things the show does with the world it exists in. Yes, it's inside a version of the Star Wars universe, but more importantly, it's inside a LEGO version of the Star Wars universe. In Ninjago, in Shima, in Nexonites, these original LEGO themes, they treat the world around them as we do. If Nia and Jay want to build a mech together, they have to build it with welding torches and wires and tons of tough work. In the Freemaker Adventures, the show takes full advantage of the fact that the characters are LEGO, meaning they can tear apart and build new ships at will, combining an X-Wing and TIE Fighter into a brand new ship with a few extra spare parts lying around. These new creations the characters call Z-Wings, or Uglies for short. What an awesome idea. Because what's a kid going to do with his LEGO Star Wars stuff? It's inevitably going to end up in pieces, and it's going to get combined with other sets to form something new and completely unique. And through Rowan Freemaker, the show celebrates this. Rowan has a connection to the Force that allows him to build new ships and objects by seeing it through the Force and letting it guide his actions. He's what's known as a Force Builder, and uses his skills to eventually get named a Master Ship Builder in the Rebel Alliance, or as he puts it, a Master Builder. While sets were made and released for the show, what other LEGO show has ever fully embraced the idea that LEGO's whatever you want to make it? The LEGO movie is really the only other piece of LEGO-related media that I have ever come across to really have that as part of its message. I mean, it's even in the name of the show itself, The Free Maker Adventures. Free to make whatever you want. On top of the great characters, the humor, and the excellent use of Star Wars and LEGO worlds, the music is spectacular. Michael Kramer from Ninjago and Jesse Nelson expertly craft their own melodies and themes, tying them into existing Star Wars tracks from John Williams that manage to stand on their own as great themes, much in the way the soundtrack from Ninjago has. The show ran for two fantastic seasons and was followed by LEGO Star Wars All-Stars. The promotional material makes the show out to be a series of shorts following famous Star Wars characters around the timeline of the Skywalker saga, but in reality, it's Freemaker Season 0 and 3 at the same time, showing how the family got started while also showing where the family is during the time of the sequel trilogy. Given that the series is short and involves the same characters, I more or less just lop it into Freemaker as one thing, even though the two are technically separate. And so, we return to the question posed at the top of the video. Is Ninjago the best LEGO series? I've spoken enough on Ninjago as a whole at this point in previous videos that I don't need to explain why Ninjago is a fantastic series. Still, as great as it can be, it has had plenty of ups and downs. Ups and downs that almost go in a cycle. It's good for a bit, then drags slightly, then picks up again for a moment, then goes back down, and then it redeems itself, and then, well, Jerry is out on where we're currently at with it. Freemaker Adventures, while it's a show that in its current state is much shorter than Ninjago, I think has proved over its course of two seasons to be of a higher quality than Ninjago, and considering how good Ninjago can be, I think that's really saying something. So while it may be weird to award another show this title in what is technically a Ninjago video, my vote for best LEGO TV series has to go to LEGO Star Wars The Freemaker Adventures. If you don't believe me, the entire series plus its follow-up are available on Disney+, Plus. so if you have it, and let's not kid around, if you're in the United States, you've got it. You can binge through all of it right now. Sorry about not touching on much Ninjago in this Ninjago video, but I've got another top 10 Ninjago video in mind for next time, so hopefully that'll peace you. Until next time, May the Force be with you.